Hello, my name is Eric Gibbard, and I chair the SNEA Security Technical Work Group. And I've been involved in storage security um, within SNEA since uh, at least 2004 and got involved with, with it going back as, as early as 2000, where I was working on some storage area networks for, for NASA at the, at the time. Um, so I've, I've got a long history in this in this space, and what I'd like to do is, is share with you some some thoughts on kind of where we are with with storage security, and and that takes the form of where did we come from, where are we today, and potentially where are we going in the uh, in the future. And when I say future, probably over the next five, maybe six years. All right, as a starting point. One of the complexities that we have to deal with in in the the storage security space is not only do you have to to, to understand uh, the storage technologies, um, but we've got these uh, interesting intersection points um, on the security side of the house, if you will, and these take the form of information security and cybersecurity, which you see on the right hand side of this diagram, and to the left. Um, we basically have to deal with things like privacy and personal uh, data protection. All of these have uh, some form of impact or driver, if you will, on security that basically falls into uh, down to the storage layer, if you will. Now, you see that there's an ethical uh, piece in here, which which also sort of drives some other activities, uh, especially if you're if you you're talking about the the, the privacy side of things. So to, to be um, uh, competent or able to deal with storage security kinds of issues, you have to have an awareness of this side of, of the problem set in addition to what's going on um, in, in the storage world. So this is typically not a entry level kind of activity um, and, and you tend to have more senior people that are uh, engaging uh, in the various activities uh, in, in what we consider to be storage security, as, as I think you'll see here shortly. All right, so let me start with uh, the past. And I'm gonna go back, you know, I've already said what my history was. Um, one of the very early works that really sort of started to, to draw the line uh, or carve out this, this storage security space as um, potentially a specialty area um, was some work that was done by Roger Cummings uh, back in um, this document was published in January 2003. But again, the work had had started, uh, you know, in advance of that for for something like this. So maybe a year or two before this. Again, early 2000s is when we we started to to see the work. And you know, interesting enough, this. Uh, this document is actually still available if, if you're interested. SNEA was an early player um, in, in this space. Um, the Storage Security Industry Forum, which uh, no longer exists, but uh, in, its, in its heyday, um, it was actually running storage security summits. Uh, you see that uh, we ran a whole series of those in 2005 through 2008 couple in the 2015-16 timeframe, and most recently one last year. And some of the results from, uh, or the recordings from last year are actually currently available. We did lots of tutorials, um, and uh, those uh, tutorials were actually delivered in the US, um, throughout the EU, Japan, India, spanning a fairly extensive period of time. So this was really more of a, in, in some ways, trying to, to help educate the, the storage professionals in terms of what they potentially need to worry about, as well as to, to, to make uh, customers and users, if you will, uh, aware of, of functionality that um, they could potentially use, um, but in some cases they needed to, to essentially ask for that. There were some best practices that were developed. Um, those were, were originally done in 2007, refreshed in in 2010, um, and a whole series of white papers that were developed over the years. Again, much of this information is still available in the SNEA sites. Um, we also see that there were there were works in in uh, managing storage systems. So, in the case of SMIS and CDMI, 
they uh, both had visions for security capabilities. Uh, and one of the things that was recognized um, fairly early on is the use of, of transport layer security was going to be important for at least the storage management side. So, so basically, this all this functionality, all this work um, was really focused on securing the storage management, um, securing the uh, the networks, the storage networks, um, and of course, data at rest encryption was uh, a, a big part of uh, you know this 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 early work and. There were some early standards that, um, in some cases, are still around. Uh, so the ISO 27040 standard was um, first international standard that really covered the full topic. So it wasn't just on storage networking; it covered sort of the full gamut. Um, NIST had a couple of of standards that came out. One dealing with sanitization, media sanitization. Another one was dealing with storage infrastructure. Um, and you know, I included the uh, fiber channel security protocol. Um, there was a couple of, of generations of, of this standard where uh, came out. This was some of the early, early work around how to go about securing fiber channel SANs, storage area networks. And of course, the Trust Computing Group did quite a bit of work in terms of how to uh, establish encryption within uh, uh, different different types of uh, of drives. So. You know this this um, this work was pretty broad. Um, it, it was in the form of recommendations, by and large. So the recommendations basically mean it's optional, and um, and and it applied to the storage systems and the ecosystems. Um, and you know, eradicating data on storage or storage sanitization was definitely recognized as. Uh, one of the things to, to worry about. So in addition to encrypting it, we also had to be able to, to make this stuff go away you know, when, when uh, the storage was repurposed or, or, uh, or disposed of. Okay, so you know, that, that was the past. You know, hopefully you build on, on the past. Um, so I apologize for this eye chart, but uh, uh, where, we, where we sit today, and, and a lot of this is, is security oriented, um, there's a large number of players who are touching on various aspects of storage security. And part of the reason of showing you this is that if you're you're looking for sort of one place where uh, you can you can uh, sort of tap in and understand everything that's happening, uh, I got some bad news for you. That's that's just not the way this is going to play. There's a lot of moving parts uh, today that that's going to grow as you'll see in the in the future. And in the formal standardization space, there's a lot of, of players. So you have to keep an eye on a lot of different things. There's a lot of interdependencies. And this just gives you some insight into um, you know the the interactions. Now, um, you know, SNIA has been involved in um, in many of these activities in terms of monitoring them. And, and so it has been over the years a, a, a useful forum to, to sort of help track what's going on in the, in the storage security space. Okay, so where are we today? What's the state of storage security? Um, in, in, in a high level, um, we're basically seeing security controls or our um, you know, element of, of all storage specification standards. That's the good news. It's you no longer a, a fight to to add security. It's it's actually a, a consideration. That's the good part. The not so good part um, is it's all in the form of guidance and recommendations. It means it's optional. And and uh, what we're seeing is a transition now to requirements where um, conformance to a particular standard means that an implementation has basically undertaken the, the, the implementation of certain security capabilities. Use of course is still optional and this is where, where some of the educational activities you know, come into play where making sure that you know, end consumers of storage technology understand what they could do and encourage them to, to, to use it to, um, to the maximum degree possible. Um, 
I'd say data at rest encryption is ubiquitous. It's actually not uncommon to, if you were to, to check the entire data path from you know, a particular application all the way down to the underlying media, you may find that uh, along the way, the data has been encrypted multiple times. And, and because of um, developments over the years, the, the penalty for doing that is uh, very, very small. Um, we're also seeing that not only is data at rest encryption uh, important, but there's now increased interest in as the data is moving around, you know, so data in motion, uh, that under certain conditions, the, there's a desire to encrypt those, those uh, transmissions. So that's a, we've had the specifications in place to allow for that um, for quite some time. Um, but there's really not been um, sort of drivers to have that, but we are beginning to see a, 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 an uptake in interest in that. Storage standardization um, has has definitely shown up as a mandate in lots of, of jurisdictions. Uh, the EU is is definitely um, laid out requirements that have gotten the attention of the storage industry. Um, when you hear sanitization, it typically takes the form of clear purge versus destruct. Um, due to circular economy issues, we're trying to, to, to move from a mode of where destruct is, is the sort of default way of handling storage once it's been, uh, its life is, is, is over, so to speak, it's being disposed of. Uh, maybe use purge so that uh, you know, parts can be recovered or it could potentially go to sort of secondary markets. Um, so standardization is pretty commonly available. Um, where we're seeing some interesting conversations is what I call proof of data eradication. So proof of standardization is, did I run the right commands to, to make the data go? And you, you basically collect some evidence and you know if there's ever an issue. But we're now seeing, because of this circular economy, uh, uh, a desire to, as a, from a particular implementation perspective, proved to me that the data has actually been eliminated on the drive. Um, and, and so that's an area that we're seeing uh, the storage industry is, is looking at, you know, how, how can we do that? How can we do that in a consistent manner? So you know, that, that is something to keep an eye on, and if, especially if it's an area of concern. You know, storage security is also now a, a, an integral part of information systems auditing. So recent changes in some of the ISO 27000 series information security management standards um, now actually have language that, that's storage oriented, as well as having pointers to the documents that are specific to, to, to storage security. So what this means is when an auditor comes in and looks at a data center, one should expect that they will uh, most likely look at the storage infrastructure where in the past it was kind of in the back room and out of sight, out of mind. And that's definitely not the case now. All right, so one of the key documents dealing with storage security is the ISO 27040 that uh, you know, I mentioned earlier. Um, it's undergoing a revision. In fact, we're very close to having the next edition of that uh, published, I'm estimating mid uh, 2023. Um, Big changes in that it now includes requirements. So essentially it's establishing a baseline of storage security requirements. That's how you could kind of think of that. Um, and there's there's been a completely new structure established and it's uh, it's got a lot of new technologies that, that to, for example, NVMe over fabrics, IPMI, uh, dealing with archives. Um, another really important uh, detail is there was a lot of content on how to sanitize media. As you can imagine, after seven years, many of those forms of media, storage media, don't exist or are not in use. So the document now defers the, the specific techniques to a new IEEE standard, uh, 2883, which is focused on, on storage standardization. And that document was published back in uh, August of uh, 2022. So this, this new... The story standardization document in conjunction with 27040 are sort of the core uh, international standards that uh, one should be aware of. 
All right, so there's some other things to, to consider in, in this space. Um, Product-based security certifications you know, come up. So if you've got encryption, which, you know, as I said earlier, it's pretty much ubiquitous, um, that typically leads to a need to do uh, a NIST 5140 certification. And we're transitioning from 140-2 to 140-3. That, that started about a year ago. Um, there, there's some growing pains um, in, in terms of you know, getting, getting through this new certification program. Um, so it's important to, you know, to be aware of, of, of those, if, if you, especially if you're supporting um, U.S. government and potential Canadian um, governments. Um, but there's equivalent international standards um, that uh, may come to play in, in other countries as well. There's also common criteria, which is known as ISO 15408. Um, brand new version of that came out in August of 2022, and we're in the midst of a transition um, to this new form of, of common criteria. Um, this is um, likely to be important in the future. We're seeing in, in Europe uh, where they're trying to set up an EU-wide scheme, and we're expecting uh, there'll be requirements for products will have to go through some form of common criteria certification in the, in, in the future. Another area is Open Compute Project, OCP. Um, both the security and storage, there are a bunch of other projects there, um, but, but a lot of focus on attestation, measurement, change of ownership and recovery. We're also seeing specifications for SSDs, NVMe-based SSDs with, with actual security requirements. And some of these are not trivial to, to to basically meet. So, you know, these are, um, in, in many ways, OCP is, is where a lot of the hyperscalers have come together to try and figure out what they might need from, from their suppliers, including storage suppliers. So let's move to talk a little bit about the future. And this is where I pull out my not so crystal ball and um, look at, you know, what, what's going on. So, Right now, from a storage security development perspective, we see quite a bit of work underway with NVMe over fabrics. Um, the, uh, depending on the transport that's being used, the, the security can, can, can be radically different from almost no security to um, quite a bit of security. So for example, if fiber channel is one of the transports then, then work that's previously been done in the fiber channel security space, uh, can be leveraged. Likewise, if you're using TCP, uh, you get the benefit of things like TLS and things of that nature. Um, computational storage is something that, that SNEA and NVM Express uh, have been working on specifications in. Uh, we're seeing the inclusion of what we call security considerations, at least at the architecture level. Um, it's not clear how the specific mechanisms to achieve what what's being identified as considerations will show up, for example, in NVMe. So this is definitely a, a to be de determined kind of arena. And um, diff differentiating when, when multi-tenancy scenarios come into play, the security gets a lot more complex. Uh, we see Keeper IO, uh, which is a new fine-grained encryption um, targeting you know, SSDs. Uh, the idea is you, you use the encryption engine on the SSD, but you do all the key management uh, from from the host side, um, very different model from sort of the traditional, you know, Opal TCG Opal based SSDs, where all of that self contained in in the in the drive. Um, the specifications on that are very close to being uh, finished, and it'll be interesting to see you know where where we go from here. Um, the DMTF has a variety of 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 protocols that it specified, but one important one to keep an eye on is the security protocols and data models, SPDM. And in particular, it uh, it could be a very powerful uh, tool for dealing with authentication and attestation mechanisms. So this is you know establishing trust between components. It also can, can handle some aspect of communications, uh, security kinds of things. Out of the PCI uh, Express, uh, we've got the data object exchange and integrity and data encryption, uh, known as IDE. Um, these are two different specifications. The work on the specs are pretty much done, um, and you know the various vendors are kind of looking at at uh, 
what what potentially needs to be done there. And because of the nature, it's you know, let's think of it as link encryption. You you need you know both endpoints need to be able to participate in in, in some of this. Likewise, if you're familiar with uh, CXL, um, there are you know security elements that that are being specified. Again, it's more of identifying what potentially will be used. But as you can imagine, if you're trying to use CXL for uh, extending memory, um, speed is a premium. And if you're adding something like link encryption to that, um, that could have a pretty significant impact on, on your ability to, to, to move data uh, quickly if that's not been handled uh, uh, correctly. So that's definitely going to be uh, something to watch uh, in the in the near future. On the event horizon, um, I see some some activities in uh, what we call privacy preserving computing technology. So trusted execution environments, we could see uh, TEs show up uh, in uh, storage systems themselves or even storage devices. Um, we're also seeing homomorphic and fully homomorphic encryption are, are uh, technologies that you know, the storage layer may at some point have to deal with. Uh, and this is a very different kind of, of encryption mechanism. Um, and it's, it's basically uh, being standardized at the international level, at least fully homomorphic, homomorphic already is. But how it actually gets used is, is definitely a, an, an open discussion. Um, yeah, I mentioned OCP earlier. There's a, a particular activity called Calyptra. Um, this is looking to essentially um, establish a silicon IP block um, for roots of trust for measurement. Um, this is really targeting the hyperscalers and data center space. Um, but, but think of this as a system on a chip or you know an ASIC that this functionality would would be embedded there. Specifications are you know under development right now. Um, and you know th there there's anticipations that um, this kind of technology would be available potentially in the 2026 yeah time frame so not that far out all right so a little bit of summary storage security has definitely matured uh, uh, just a massive amount over the last 20 years as, as somebody who has been in the middle of this during this period the transition is phenomenal we're definitely seeing storage systems and ecosystems are they're, they're a viable part of a defense in depth strategy. They may actually serve as the last line of defense for data. Um, we're seeing that the, you know there's clear indications that that new capabilities are, are going to be emerging over the the next few years. Customer adoption is is very uncertain at the moment. Part of that's because they just don't know what's coming, um, and and you know there's complexity is often. Uh, not a friend of adoption, and we're, we're definitely seeing that the how, how all these pieces, uh, you know, inter interplay, how the interdependencies work, are I think gonna gonna be sort of a determining factor on some of the adoption. There's lots of complexities here. I would say sort of a bottom line issue to 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 leave with you, you know, if you fail to secure, you know, the storage, it's it it's likely to have legal and or regulatory repercussions. A, a lot of the regulations are basically written in in terms of reasonable security. And uh, if if you were not aware of some of the changes, that, that bar for reasonable security is definitely moving uh, on a fairly regular basis. And uh, if you're not keeping tabs of that or adopting some of these new technologies, you may find yourself at a significant disadvantage if there's a data breach or some sort of issue that uh, um, draws the bead of, of the legal or regulatory community. All right, so there are lots of places to sort of plug in on various aspects of this. Um, as I said earlier, you, know, you, saw, you saw that sort of eye chart that shows all the interactions. Well, many of the organizations here aren't necessarily on that list as well. And, and so there's many more places that, that one has to sort of monitor you know, where these specifications are being developed today. But this, this gives you an idea of where some of the, the action is today and, and where I anticipate in the, uh, in the future. So hopefully this has provided uh, some, some useful detail for you. Um, please take a moment to, to, to rate the session. Uh, we really do appreciate the feedback. 
it helps us determine whether this kind of information is useful to you or not, and uh, whether we you know, continue providing this kind of kind of detail in the in the not too distant future. So, with that, um, thank you for your time, and I wish you a safe computing. Until the next time.